Um, so right now we have a live video going on three different cam cameras, so I just want to preface that before we start. Um, we have one in Facebook in my private group, one on the Atlantic PT Instagram, and then one on camera. Um, so we'll just kind of jump right into it. My name is Melissa Conover. I am an online um, virtual private nutrition coach and registered dietitian to be. And I'm Justin Sampson. I'm a doctor of physical therapy with the Atlantic Physical Therapy Center. Um, I'm also the clinic director here at our South Brunswick location. Um, so just to introduce ourselves a little bit more in depth um, and a little bit what I do, uh, we decided to do a live video because fitness and nutrition and injury prevention, even recovery, are very related. Um, there was a post on the Atlantic PT site, actually, that was talking about if you don't make time for your wellness, you're going to have to make time for your sickness, your disease, your injury, all of that. Um, and I thought that was very true. Um, so that's actually why I became a dietitian. I am very into fueling your body and more on the prevention side. You can really go into any side of it um, in nutrition. You can work in the clinical setting at the hospital, um, with athletes, in corporate wellness. Um, but I really like fueling your body for performance. Um, so that's why I was really drawn to that post. And for me, um, I, to be a dietitian, you actually have to go through four years of undergrad at an accredited school through, through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, and then you have to do, the, the master's degree is optional. I decided to do that first. You can really do that at any point, um, but it will be required as of 2024 to have a master's degree. And then you have to take, um, do 1,200 hours or more of clinical supervised practice in various settings and then take the um, RD exam. So that's my last step. Um, and I actually decided in the meantime to open up my own um, business doing nutrition coaching because I've seen a lot of misleading information on social media. And instead of getting upset about it, I decided to do something about it. Um, so we're gonna get a little into that um, throughout our questions, but that's kind of where I'm at. And yeah, and I decided that um, fueling your body is very important. All right, so, uh, so I'm a physical therapist. So basically we evaluate, treat anybody who has pain, injuries, um, whether it be after surgery or just kind of something that pops up out of nowhere. Um, we also work a little bit with injury prevention, um, making sure people are moving as ideally as possible. Um, so similar to with, with the schooling, so I had to do four years of undergrad and then three years of graduate school to get my doctorate, which is required for anyone coming out of PT school now. Um, and now I've been practicing for a little over two and a half years, coming up on three years now. Awesome. So um, do you want to get into the questions and then at the end, the Q&A? Yeah, sure. So just for anyone watching, um, there will be, we'll kind of open it up at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions, just ask them right now. Just comment as many as you can think of, and then we'll try to run through it. Um, I'm not sure if the Facebook is actually live, but the Instagram one is definitely there. So just let us know. Um, all right, so you want to get into it? You want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so when you first meet a client, um, what are some of the things that you do to help kind of build trust and buy-in. I know with your, you know, with your field, it takes a decent amount of time to see significant results. So how do you kind of build that buy-in? Um, so to build the trust and like the rapport with my clients, or even before they are a client, I always jump on a call with I call a discovery call with um, anyone who is looking to work with me. Um, because I do virtual online nutrition coaching, you're hiring me as your coach and trusting me. So I have about um, 10 clients right now, um, and I'm expected to grow, definitely. Um, but before we even they even become my client, we hop on a call. I go through kind of their goals and different things that they're looking to do. I explain that it's not a quick process. A lot of people are used to from social media. You know, they want the 30-day fix, the three-day fix, the 10-day cleanse, whatever it is. Um, it's definitely not that. A lot of people expect to, you know, they don't realize they gained weight or lost muscle in however many years. It's not going to take 30 days to fix it. Um, so I'm very upfront with that. And also, I'm not the food police, so I'm very upfront with that as well. I always tell my um, prospective clients that if they're going to work with me, they are allowed to have any food they want. Um, I don't restrict. 
it's more so about like the balance and figuring out what's best for their needs, their goals, especially with athletes um, and fueling for performance. And then I kind of just let them know that um, most of my clients see the most progress working with me for six to nine months. There's no contract, but that's really how long it takes to get to the progress, um, see your results, and then build those habits that actually last to then maintain for the rest of your life. Because the problem with these you know, cycle diets, people do it and they do Whole30 30, 30 times, like just for years and years, when really I'm educating to then um, give people the confidence and the knowledge that they can make their own decisions to really use for the rest of their life, whether they're an athlete throughout their career or you know, post-athlete um, afterwards or you know, older up till you're 95 years old, not just for 95 days. That's what I feel like we're kind of we're luckier than you in that regard because like we have somebody come in, you know, I can usually do at least one thing that will either make them feel better or move in a way they haven't been able to move right. in a while. Yeah. And that kind of usually creates that that quick buy-in right. and then that'll kind of like hook them and they'll see that, okay, PT is actually going to help me. Right. Like if they come in super skeptical. So I know mm -hmm. that's got to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, one thing I do do for that, um, when we do get into a call and I kind of explain that if they do decide to become my client, I always give like one to three action goals. So it's not just like, oh, you want to work with me? Oh, drink more water. Like, <laughs> eat more vegetables. Like, what does that mean? So I give like specific, you know, this many hours of this pre post workout, you know, fueling that. So I guess that's kind of in a sense, but that's yeah. more so our first call. Um, whereas like kind of, you know, seeing who wants to be a client. Mm. So set those kind of like yeah. smaller goals yeah. on the way to the large goal. Exactly, yeah. Um, I guess I can ask a question to you. Um, so mine was more so about um, just like in general, I know you guys have, I think, 18 different locations I saw. So I was wondering if you personally work with mostly injured patients um, or more, more so you specifically for like injury prevention, personal training, or if it's really just kind of even with both. So. A large majority of the people we see are for injuries or people who are in pain. Um, that's mostly what we see. Um, and now even with, with PT, we have what's called direct access now. Okay. So in New Jersey, at least, and a lot of other states, you can actually see a physical therapist without a prescription from a doctor. Wow. Um, it's covered by about 90% of insurances. Um, but we are a little limited, so we can treat you for up to 12 visits or 30 days from the evaluation. Okay. Um, if we wanted to continue beyond that, then we have to refer you back to a doctor to get a prescription. Okay. Um, but that kind of allows us to see people, even like right after an injury, if somebody sprains their ankle, instead of going to their primary care, then get, going to the ortho, and then right. getting sent to PT, and now we're seeing them a week or two after the injury, we can see them usually within a day or two after it happens and wow. kind of get the process started. Mm -hmm. um, we do see occasionally some injury prevention people. I've had a few uh, patients who were like CrossFit athletes who were coming in and said, you know, something just doesn't quite feel right with my overhead press. I just want to make sure there's no issues. Okay. Or um, we also do offer. Um, you know, on occasion we do like balance screenings at a lot of the, the communities around or sometimes even in the offices. Um, so that can kind of assess fall risk in elderly patients or people with balance deficits. Um, we also do a lot of like ACL screenings okay. to assess patients' risks for ACL tears. Wow. Um, we kind of look at their landing, jumping mechanics, um, strength imbalances, uh, things like that. And so we do get some patients on that, almost like a prevention basis. Okay. But we do, it's mostly people who are in pain and already hurt. Right, right. Okay. Take insurance. Um, mm -hmm. It is out of pocket, but um, I do kind of tell people it's very much like a specialty type of thing where I am literally can talk to you from anywhere in the world. So if you're on vacation in Italy, we can still be connecting. Um, I have a lot of patients or clients who send me like menus, like literally at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, I'm like giving them, you know, advice or whatever it is, or asking me, you know, um, about to work out, what's like best for this. So um, I guess that's in the convenience sense, mm -hmm. like how you're saying they can like right away yeah. see you. It's similar in that sense. Um, but besides that, mine's definitely like a unique thing. Cause I mean, when are you like texting your doctor just being like, yeah, hey doc, like what's going on? So like, 
I like that, and a lot of my clients like that it's a very convenient um, yeah. thing where they can, sometimes I even like walk around because of like the importance of fitness. Mm -hmm. We'll do like um, a coaching call where my clients will walk and I'll talk ah. to them while I'm walking, they're walking okay. and kind of get our steps in, so. Smart. Yeah. So, so what do you feel like is the biggest barrier between the general population and eating, you know, in a broad term, a, a healthy diet? Um, I would say the term health is very um, almost like stigmatized. People are definitely under fueling. I'd say that's actually the biggest thing I see. Um, a lot of times, probably 95% of the time, I have people who are eating less than 1,200 calories a day, and um, you know they're working out five times a week. They're you know barely stretching, and they're stressed out, and they have all these things. Um, and people will be like, "Oh, you know, my fitness pal told me to eat this, though," and you know, that's great that they try, they're trying to, you know, be proactive and take care of themselves and eat healthier, but a lot of people, because of diet culture, think that less means better, um, or less food means healthy, and it doesn't necessarily mean that at all, so um, actually because people are underfueling, a lot of times I have to first increase their calories to really get their body to, um, you know, feel right and kind of balance, and then you know, be able to get to that point of needing to then lose weight or gain muscle or whatever it is. So definitely, I think it's really mostly around just this, like, mis... The mentality around yeah, it. Yeah, like, people just kind of hear it and just, it's it's a lot around, like, diet culture and, like, just, I think it's a lot of more so, like, about the cleanses and, like I was saying, like, mm -hmm. it's you know, the military diet, eat 500 calories for whatever days, like things like that that are just like jazz and crazy, but that's why I educate and, you know, do whatever yeah. I can to work on various factors to really like help fuel athletes and really any active individual. So, um, and then for you, um, I forgot this one. Um, what is the most common used piece of equipment that you use with patients? I assume it's different for everyone, but for the most So part. for me in this office, I would say it's got to either be kettlebells or the cable column that we have over there. Okay. Um, just because both of them are kind of so versatile in what they can be used for. Right. Um, you know, that cable column has you know, like 10 different attachments and yeah. can adjust to all different heights and and then kettlebells can you know just be used for so much functionally you know to simulate things that you have to do throughout a day right and that's ultimately what I'm trying to do with my patients mm -hmm. is get them to a point where they can do everything they need to do throughout a day right. without pain or limitation mm -hmm. so if I can simulate that in a controlled environment then they're going to be more confident to be able to do that when they go home and not even, not even have to think about it or right. like kind of like mentally prep themselves like oh, okay yeah. I have to pick up this 25 pound box of you know clothes is this going to hurt my back right I'd much rather build their confidence, work with them here on their mechanics, things like that, and get them to the point where, okay, I know how to do this. I've done this a million times at yeah. PT. Okay. That's so. pretty cool. I wouldn't even think of kettlebell, but yeah, definitely all those uses. So I guess you work on more so like practical and like the proper form to actually bend down instead of yeah. working with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So many people come in and are fearful of picking something up off the ground. Wow. Where if you just make like a few small tweaks and yes. kind of take the fear out of it, then they're, they're able to pick up more weight than they've picked up in five years, right. you know? Right, right. But that, that whole mental aspect of it of, okay, I did this once and my, you know, my back hurt after it, so I avoided it for the rest of my life. Right, yeah. You know, it's more about doing it properly and you know, training yourself mm -hmm. to stress the right areas instead of the wrong areas right. to get to that point. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure like with um, inflammation issues and, you know, not stretching and all that, that's mm -hmm. probably like a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, a lot of people when they get hurt, you know, we've all heard the, the rice method for so long, you know, yeah. <laughs> rest it, ice it, you know, take it easy and let it heal. Right. But especially now, it's coming out more and more that yeah, you need to calm it down, but you also need to keep moving. Right. You know, you need to. You can't baby it too much because that's ultimately going to set you back in the long run right. too. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it's all about kind of like starting small and then building yourself back up rather than just trying to, it's not one or the other. You don't jump right back into what right. you're doing, but you also don't just kind of sit there and do nothing, right. at least more than like a day or two max. Yeah. Um, but yeah, stretching is, you know, maintaining mobility is a big part of it too, because once people stop moving right. and stop, stop using their full range of motion for things like that, yeah. then they start to lose it. Your mm -hmm. body is quick to adapt that way. Definitely, yeah. So a lot of that, that maintenance work is, is definitely necessary. Okay, yeah, it sounds like you're um, kind of like a marathon, not a sprint, and that's kind of like yeah. what I talk about a lot too. Even, I mean, I talk about other goals besides nutrition, but yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So I know, you know people come to you obviously looking to live a healthier life. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, diet's a huge part of that, but activity level and exercise is a huge part of that too. Right. What general recommendations do you give your clients um, as far as exercise and activity when they, when they start working with you? Um, I actually go off the guidelines, so everything I do is always like evidence-based. Sometimes I'll send people articles or you know just go off of the science. So I try to go off guidelines as much as possible, um, just kind of sticking to like, and it really depends on, you take that, and of course I'm sure you do this too, and then you kind of have to apply to each person. Yeah. So generally 150 minutes um, of physical activity, like moderate physical activity a week is good. Um, in addition to like 75 minutes of like vigorous activity or like a combination of both. Um, up to like even 300 minutes, you know, um, but of course not overexerting, mm -hmm. taking a rest day, uh, fueling proper, properly, and then including, so that would be like aerobic activity, and then including at least two days of um, strength training, bone, you know, um, bone and strength training, like muscle training, um, and then stretching and rolling. Okay. So I always talk about, and and I only go so far because I, I want to get actually eventually certified. So I, I never give specific um, exercises mm -hmm. unless I send like a video from someone else or like refer out. Um, but I do recommend um, stretching and rolling at least for a few minutes and then beforehand to kind of like loosen up and doing, you know, active stretches. And then afterwards, same thing to prevent like the DOMS and uh, the delayed onset muscle soreness. And of course, then refueling. So we work. Once I get more specific with my clients, we really get into like pre-workout um, nutrition, post-workout nutrition, around physical activity, and then sometimes I'll even set like an actual physical activity goal. So like I said, I do one to three goals. It, for that, for someone, if they're really struggling to like get to the gym, we'll be like, okay, you know what? This is gonna be a goal, and we'll figure out exactly how to do it, how to do it, how long, and you know, what they're gonna do before and after. Yeah. The, the biggest issue I see with, with people is a lot of them have an all or nothing mentality. Yeah. They go from being super inactive and get on this kick and say, all right, I'm gonna be healthy now. And they start you know, running miles and miles right. or you know, going to the gym and heavy squatting, bench mm -hmm. pressing with, and it's more activity than they've done in so long. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'll see people who come, you know, they say they have knee pain and I'll say, you know, what, what have you been doing recently? Oh, I, I recently started running, you know, five to ten miles a day, right. you know, to train for a marathon, and they haven't run five to ten miles in ten years. Right. You know, obviously that's going to be outside of your body's capacity for that point in time. Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they want to push themselves so hard, but you kind of have to like ramp the body up before you get into that level of volume and intensity. Absolutely. For for anything yeah. really, not you know, not just running, but yeah. You know, even something as simple as walking. So if someone's been sedentary for so long, if you go and walk 10 miles, that could flare things up and irritate it because it's more stress right. on the joints and your body than it's been through recently. Yeah. So I think, you know, like you said, like a step-by-step -step progression of easing into things is always right. the most you know ideal way of going into it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, I see a lot where, like I said, it's kind of a, a multitude of factors. So like when someone comes to me and they're like, yeah, I'm just tracking on my fitness pal. It's like, well, my fitness pal doesn't account for all the other things. Yeah. You not working out for this long, you having all this stress in your life, you know, you um, aren't sleeping. So now, and actually when you're not sleeping, less than seven hours of sleep, a night can actually increase your risk for injury by like 70%. So yeah. now, now they're not sleeping and then they're under fueling, they're overexerting themselves and exercise. And that's just like, a disaster waiting to happen. So I think it's really important that you know 
physical therapy and nutrition go together um, in the sense that people really need to look at the big picture. And you're right, I feel like it is. A lot of people tell me that with diets too. They'll be like, well, you know, I was really good for 10 days and then I just, you just fell off. it was too much. And <laughs> yeah. that's why I really work on like a balanced approach of like flexible dieting where you kind of can make choices. And we work on, like I said, small goals to get you to the next step. So it's not so like go big or go home. It's just like a little at a time. And then you look back three months, you're like, wow. So like same thing for like even like resistance training. I'm sure yeah. you've seen where like someone may not think they're progressing and then you're like, well, think about how you were three months ago. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, that is how I was. So, um, so going off that for physical therapy, when you are with people, do you ever get like specific um, questions around nutrition since they are so related that you feel you have to either refer out or um, so can answer? It's usually less specific. Okay. Um, I'll get asked on occasion like general questions. People, you know, if a lot of people will come in with like knee arthritis and on the verge of like needing a knee replacement and their doctor tells them, you know, you need to lose weight right. you know, to reduce some of the stress on the joints. You know, and then, you know, I'm spending an hour a day, three times a week with, with this person. So right. they, you know, a lot of times they'll ask me, you know, what should I do to try and lose weight? Mm -hmm. And I will never get specific because that's, it's not in my scope. I don't have right. enough of an expertise in nutrition. Yeah. So I've never had a specific nutritionist or dietitian to refer them to. Okay. But I will recommend that they seek one out if yeah. they want further questioning. Um, you know, some of the, I, I've never actually, you know, like I said, I don't give specifics, but some of the advice, and you can like, correct me if I'm wrong on some of this, some of the advice that I've heard from, from people in the past is, you know, if you're grocery shopping, stay on the outside of the, the grocery <laughs> store because it's more, you know, right. natural stuff, fruits, vegetables, mm -hmm. you know things like that, opposed to like the processed stuff in the in the center of the store. Yeah. Um, that That's the one thing I feel very few people in the world eat enough vegetables. Mm -hmm. Like like fruits and vegetables, but mostly vegetables. Right, I agree. So like sometimes I'll just recommend people, you know, try eating some more vegetables. Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily like make anything, any drastic changes. Right. But um, yeah, that's kind of the extent of it. Yeah. Um, but now, now I have someone I can uh, <laughs> I can refer them to. If yeah, someone specific. Yeah, and even like going off your post that was on your page of saying um, for anyone tuning in, um, it was a post about you know making time for your wellness. Um, otherwise, you will basically have to make time for your um, injury, your sickness, and all of that. And I think it's important for that. A lot of people think like they have to take away these things, and you know. Um, eat less and like I said, you know, exercise more and I think it's just kind of remembering that they can really just think about like what's best for them and what they can add to their diet. Yeah. So definitely. So when you're dealing with your clients, how much of a psychological component is there when you're working with clients? Whether it be like as far as like committing to everything mm -hmm. or know stressing out about you know all the breakdowns of everything they have to do yeah um, just how much does the psychological component play a role like 110 <laughs> percent um, yeah I mean it's it really is all about mindset um, you know from beginning to end even when I'm talking to someone if they view my program as a cost versus an investment they're not going to see that value in their health um, and that kind of goes back to even that quote um, that you posted, like, if you view your health as an investment to then move on, um, that's really when you're going to get the changes that you want. And even when you start working with me, if you're like, you know, I want to do this, but I'm too busy. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. So yeah, you could be the craziest, you know, you could have five kids running around like crazy, but there are definitely ways to manage where you're at and get you to a little closer to where you want to be. Um, also, even like for injury, I have some people um, who have come to me and just like, I just can't do it. And then I'll kind of take a, take a step back. Well, have you, I actually have recommended, have you seen a physical therapist? Have you gone to your doctor? Are you stretching? Are you actually doing, they'll be like, yes, I, I am. Like I've gotten to one, we're done. Like, are you actually doing the exercises? Well, no, no, not really. Well, okay, well, you know, maybe reconsider going back or um, even for like mental health aspects, um, they'll just be like, you know, I have, um, 
I'm just not feeling well, I'm not great, I'm low in energy, okay, you know what, instead, why don't we think about things we can add, why don't we, you know, maybe consider talking to someone, um, maybe consider, you know, drinking more water, you know, little changes that can really make the difference, but it really does go into all back to mindset. It's really how you view something, um, really in any circumstance, and I feel like that's kind of like physical therapy too, like I've seen it, I'll, even a lot of people will tell me, you know, I'll just ask how, you know, do you exercise? I don't know, I haven't done in a while, so I just, I feel like I can't, or um, I can't get to the gym. I'll be like, well, what if you pack a bag and go right from work? Oh yeah, I guess I could do that. And then you kind of really just, and that's really what my programming is about. It's a lot about accountability, because um, the motivation is not always going to be there, and that's why it's so great for physical therapy too. You know, if you give these people, if you just printed out something, here you go, send them on their way, they're not really going to do it. Whereas yeah, if you actually exactly. sit with them and work with them, you know, I think it's more of like, it's really like a mental block and until they realize, like, okay, this really isn't so bad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see the same thing with, with our patients as far as like the mental aspect of it. Um, you know, an example, you know, I've had patients in here who come in like before they get ACL surgery mm -hmm. um, for a few visits of like pre-op PT. And they come in and they, I ask them to bend their knee and they, they can only bend their knee like 60, 70 degrees. And you know, I know that there's nothing physically there stopping their knee from bending. Right. It's the fear and their nervous system trying to protect its yeah. bo the body because it knows that there's something wrong at the knee. Right. So after I kind of educate them on that and you know, you know, take them through some graded movement of their knee, and then by the end of the session, you know, you know, I have one girl who came in, at, you know, she came in for her eval before surgery, could barely bend her knee. Mm -hmm. Came in her next visit before I even laid a hand on her, her heel touched her butt. Oh my God. And it was like just magic. once she pushed through that mental barrier, like I didn't stretch anything. Right. I didn't you know, physically change any of her you know, physical structures mm -hmm. in her knee. But that mental component of it, that block was gone. Wow. So now her body was able to do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Since there was nothing limiting it. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, even um, going off that with you know, injury and post-op, pre-op, I think a lot of people um, that I, I can definitely see the mental barrier, and then you know, with the education of, you know, okay, do these things beforehand, do these things after, and then accounting nutrition for that. Um, there's a lot of foods that can help with inflammation, and um, a lot of foods that can help wound healing, and even you know, recovery down the line, and keep that even whether or not you know, post surgery, but also an athlete post workout. Yeah. You know, from really any any end of the spectrum. Um, so yeah, I can, I can definitely see how it kind of just all really connects and people, you know, once they realize that and it clicks for people, they're like, oh, okay, you know what, maybe I can, I'll just take the steps and maybe it is my mindset, so maybe I do need help, maybe I do need a physical therapist, maybe I do need a dietitian, maybe I do need, you know, all that. So um, with that, do you ever see any specific um, issues with like post-op or um, wound healing where you have to like delay treatment because Absolutely. of it? Yeah. Um it's usually in patients who have like multiple comorbidities, you know, okay. they have diabetes, they have mm -hmm. cardiovascular issues, which all, you know, kind of as we were talking about, kind of stems from similar issues that, you know, years and years of leading up to that. Right. Um, but yeah, I've seen it a lot, mostly with diabetes and patients who are chronic smokers. Okay. Those are the two big ones that really, really delay healing. Right. Um, and you know, not only you know, like incision healing mm -hmm. after surgery, but bone healing, tendon healing. Yes. You know, patients who get rotator cuff repairs, people, uh, patients who suffer from fractures. Mm -hmm. I I've seen patients who take have taken twice as long to be allowed to put weight on their leg after a fracture because the bone healing was delayed because they were smoking packs of cigarettes right. even while they were continuing to see me oh my gosh. and I you know you try to hammer it home you know you should really you know at least cut back if yeah. not stop completely um, but you know it, it definitely plays a factor and can limit us sometimes with how far we are able to go when we're treating the patient right yeah yeah definitely and um, I think it all ties back to nutrition too because there is, um, you know, some things we learn about to help and um, 
kind of support wound healing. So when people don't do that, and then you know that kind of delays everything. I've seen it in the hospital, and I was in clinical, and that's why I assumed it was kind of similar for this. If people come to you sooner, especially if you're saying they can come to you very quickly, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of unfortunate because then it's delaying the process, and then of course if now they're not moving, and then they're losing muscle mass. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely important I think for people to really take into account all the different factors and. Um, really think about their you know hydration there's certain nutrients um, macronutrients so like carbs fat protein um, that can help with specifically with wound healing and then some vitamins and minerals that I work with specifically um, so that definitely plays a part and I can see how that would kind of be frustrating I'm sure for you know people working and if they have to cancel and but also for the patient you know when they come in and now they can't get the help and it's probably a little discouraging yeah definitely. I'm sure. and then the other part how you know not necessarily with like wound and delayed healing, but a lot of what we do with patients is essentially strength training. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of it sometimes is low level strength training or, you know, like motor control, but protein intake is gonna have a huge effect on, you know, if you're able to progress as quickly as you should. Yeah. You know, not, you know, not necessarily with people loading up a barbell and squatting or right. deadlifting, but <laughs> even when we're doing work on you know, somebody's rotator cuff, trying mm -hmm. to get them stronger, um, and even more so after surgery, you know, you're trying to rebuild tissue that's been damaged. Right. You need to be getting that protein intake to facilitate that, you know, that build. Specific amino acids that, you know, amino acids are the building blocks of protein, and there are um, a few, three in particular, that help with muscle protein synthesis and of course you know you have to take into account if someone's a vegetarian or a vegan if they have dietary restrictions and um, and then how much are they getting like you said and uh, I think people don't realize it's really important to get enough not too much like excessive amounts of protein people don't have to be downing protein shakes yeah. all day but enough because even post-workout your body's still repairing itself 24 to 48 hours mm -hmm. after and um, it's really important, especially for athletes or, you know, recovering from an injury to really keep that in mind that, you know, you need more when you're stressed and when your body is going through what, you know, physical activity is yeah. a stress. So, yeah, that's definitely important. That's awesome. Absolutely. Um, so if you had, now I, I know I generally avoid living, you know, you know in terms of absolutes, mm -hmm. you know, but if you had to give one dietary recommendation that a majority of the population would benefit from, what would it be? Um, well, I was gonna say the vegetables thing, but you already covered that, so I thought of another one actually. So that's of course very important, um, you know, eating more at home and more vegetables and you know, like you said, chopping the perimeter, that's definitely awesome. Um, but my biggest thing I think would say to stop labeling food as good or bad, because I think that really almost um, causes some of the um, restriction and then overeating with some people, they think, I can't have this, I can't have this, I can't have this. So now, you know, maybe you're trying to have something else and now you're thinking about this other food. Um, whereas, you know, instead you can just plan for that food, account it into your diet, and then kind of factor in the other vegetables yeah. and other things. You know, for example, um, at a party, I know even like, you know, whether you're diabetic or not diabetic, if you're, say you want like a fruit bowl, right? And you have mm -hmm. this fruit bowl and someone's like, oh, I, I know you're watching your weight. So they give you this fruit bowl, but you really want cake. You're like, this cake is bad, this cake is bad. You're putting this like bad label and almost like stress around mm -hmm. this food. So you eat the, the fruit bowl, which has sugar, which is great, has lots of fiber and nutrients, fantastic for you. But now you're still wanting this cake. So eventually, you know, you're eating other things to try to compensate, you're adding calories, you probably don't realize, you're picking. And then eventually you give in, you have the cake, but then you feel guilty. And a lot of people I get um, come to me and they'll be like, you know, that's really when I gave up. I had these bad foods and then I just gave up completely. Yeah. Um, you know, and like you said, it kind of goes back to the all or nothing mindset where they're like, they either have to be 100% perfect and clean, which that's not even a thing around dieting unless you're watching your vegetables and fruit, which I hope you are, um, or like perfect or good, or they think bad, negative, junk food, you know, whereas, Instead, I'd rather people just think of more often or less often. Um, I love ice cream, so no one will ever tell me I cannot have ice cream ever again. Do I have it seven times a day, every day? No, but you definitely can work in, I think, every food 
So I think that's really important for people to stop labeling good or bad. And that kind of goes back to, you know, nutrition coaches, dietitians, they're not the food police. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's definitely important. Um, how about you for physical therapy? If there's one thing you think people should really keep in mind for general, you know, activity life, what's like one thing they should really focus on, especially for like prevention, but really for total. So for prevention, at least as far as athletes go, I think you need to, they need to train how to land, decelerate, and change direction. I see way too many people nowadays are training the gas pedal. Everyone wants to run faster, mm -hmm. jump higher, be stronger, lift more weight. Nobody's learning how to, you know, stop all that power. Right. So now you're, you're taking this high powered engine and the brakes are shot. Mm. And that's when you can't control things and that's what leads to a lot of injuries. Yeah. Is that, you know, you can't control that when you, you know, get bumped out of place and have to, you know, change your landing mechanics or, you know, um, you're running full speed and have to stop on a dime and change direction. Right, so right. for athletes, I think that's the biggest thing yeah. as far as injuries because that, you know, leads to all ACL tears, you know, muscle pulls, all that comes from that inability to, you know, absorb those forces wow. rather than generate those forces. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like I said before, for the general population, it's, yeah, stay active, but do it gradually. Right. Don't just jump right into a million yep. things. And I know I kind of went into that already, but, yeah. but I think it's important. Um, you know, it's, you just have to take it easy and build yourself up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's important for fitness and nutrition in general. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that fitness and nutrition really are so related. Mm -hmm. um, I always talk about like the tortoise and the hare, like that story that um, slow and steady wins the race. It really is true. It's, you know, marathon, not a sprint. I can, you know, throw out all these things. But first of all, I love quotes. But just, I mean, it really is true. If people think, you know, more of like a balanced mindset and taking it slow, that will get them to their goal faster than if they go really hard and then give up completely or mm -hmm. go too hard and are under feeling out. and yeah. then yeah burn out or get an injury or something so yeah I, I think it's definitely important to kind of have a balance of nutrition and wellness hydration sleep stress you know all of that but also when they need it you know seek out physical therapy and um, stretching you know kind of just keep everything in mind so yeah I definitely agree that's awesome great so um, before we get into Q&A Q from you guys I just wanted to say uh, first of all thank you for viewing but if you are watching this live, if you can comment live, if you're watching this replay, um, this should be up for about 24 hours on Instagram and on my private Facebook group. Um, please comment replay. And if you have any questions, please ask. We'll get into it. And if this resonates with you, please give a thumbs up, like, heart, you know, whatever reaction you have. Um, and yeah, we'll get into it. Do you have any other questions, comments mm -hmm. before we go in? Nope. Okay. So we're gonna have um, some questions read. It looks like there may be some, maybe more on there. So if you guys have questions, please comment them. <laughs> waving? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi guys, thanks for waving. <laughs> if you're viewing, please ask questions you have from this video, we'd really appreciate it. If we scroll, can we see any? Um, down. <laughs> you can have people just waving. <laughs> just waves. Yeah, I think so. Okay. If there's no questions, that's okay. But if you guys, if anyone's viewing this, if you have, do you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to ask. We're open. Huh? Yeah, I guess not. All right. <laughs> Well, um, so do you want to, I guess we'll say how we can reach, you know, be reached specifically. Yeah, sure. um, so again, my name is Melissa Conover. My Instagram name is nutrition underscore with underscore Melissa. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, Melissa Conover's Nutrition Team. It's a private um, group that you can request me on. Or you can email me at mconover, C-O-N-O-V-E-R, 
nutrition at gmail.com. Um, you can message me, you know, email me, really any of those, um, or ask here about me. Um, yeah, I guess to reach me, you can either call the office here at South Brunswick, the number is 732-666-9955, or you can email me at jsampson at atlanticptcenter.com. All right, if there's no, any question, no more questions or no questions at all, um, then I guess that's it. Thank you guys so much for viewing, and I hope you guys have a great day.